everybody both in person and online to the current monthly iteration of the EFF Austin meetups. My name is Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. And also, our speaker this month is one of our board members and one of our founders, John Lukowski, right here to my left. Um, for those who are new, uh, don't forget Tom. Oh, and our other speakers, Tom. Well, I'm going to introduce the speakers shortly. I'm okay, doing the okay, what good. we are. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, for those who are new to EFF Austin, we're a standing over 30 years old Austin-based Digital Civil Liberties organization. We are closely affiliated with Electronic Frontier Foundation out of San Francisco. They're the nation's foremost and largest digital civil liberties advocacy organization. You can kind of think of them as the ACLU for the internet. They fight for things like your first and Fourth Amendment rights in digital spaces, um, things like you know net neutrality and, and encryption, protecting Section 230 of the CDA, and uh, just generally making it so that uh, the internet and emerging technologies are a place we can all be free to speak our minds and collaborate without unreasonable interference. Um, so yeah, um, they do very good work. Um, we tr do little bits of work where we can with them. We're the oldest member of what's known as the EFA, or the Electronic Frontier Alliance. It's a group of about 100 orgs all around the country who work with EFF on these issues. If you're watching remotely, there might be one near you. You should look into it. Um, but yeah, we're the Austin-based one, and we mostly do education, which consists of these once a month meetups, which for the time being and for quite a while have been here at Capital Factory the second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. Um, we tentatively have a January discussion coming up where we're going to be talking about the privacy coin Monero and what makes it different from other cryptocurrencies. Uh, so that should be an interesting discussion I encourage you to attend. We also um, have been known to some nice get involved in local political advocacy work. We were a fairly prominent figure in the recent coalition uh, battles uh, with the city council over whether um, our police department should be allowed to bring back automated license plate readers. We unfortunately did not win that fight, but we did have a noticeable impact on somewhat swaying some of the votes, educating council, and making it much closer than it would have been otherwise. We hope to continue that discussion with council next year. Is there an impact on policy? Um, we almost had an impact on policy. We lost by one vote. We were going to get them to lower the data retention period from 30 days to three minutes. We convinced the mayor and four other council members to agree with us, but we needed one more vote to make it law, unfortunately. But uh, that was frankly more closer than I thought it would be, even my cynical self, so we're going you to go back. You would have made it five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I was modeling it after New Hampshire state <laughs> law, which gave me a lot of credibility. I could point to that law and say, see, the sky isn't falling. They did it that way. Um, but yeah, so we do that sort of stuff. We've also been known to occasionally throw uh, cool cyberpunk parties when we can find benevolent benefactors. Hopefully we'll have one of those again someday. Um, but yeah. That's sort of what we do. We're very much community driven. We encourage you to get involved. I will also say apologies to anybody on any of our digital portals right now. I got here to discover I'm having some computer trouble, even though it was literally working before I left home, <laughs> of course. So apologies if you ask a question and I don't see it for a bit. Um, just letting you know that. Um, anyway, so without further ado, I will introduce our speakers and get our talk going here. So we have uh, two speakers for you this month, and they are both returning speakers. As I said already, we got John Lukowski here, who is one of our original founding board members um, and is still on the board and an incredibly valuable resource. John has witnessed the internet literally grow up and has been involved in many of the emerging uh, communities that um, have had debated how the internet should and shouldn't work and how we should all be free or not free to communicate with each other on it. He was uh, friends with many of the lawyers, technologists, and activists who here in Austin were involved in some of the early court cases that originally gave rise to the EFF. He's a font of... <laughs> He's a font of interesting stories on that, and I encourage if you stick around after the talk to ask him uh, more questions about that. And yeah, for I those I can remember anything. <laughs> and yes, for those who can stick around, we'll probably go hang out in the hotel bar for a minute if you want to join us for a drink and chat. Um, and then yeah, our other speaker here is uh, Tom Brown, who's been uh, I think is this your third time speaking to us? That sounds okay. right. Yeah, over ten years or so, something like that. So Tom is, uh, has joined the three timer club. Tom is a, is a programmer and technologist who has especially has always been interested in uh, essentially, you know, programmers as, as hobbyists coming together to work on building interesting coding and internet projects 
that are really community driven and about letting users both build and define their digital experiences. He's been extensively involved in a movement known as the Indie Web Movement, which you will probably learn more about. But specifically, both of them struck me as excellent people to have a discussion about one of the biggest debates going on right now in the digital world, which is, you know, you might have heard there's some people uh, a little angry about things going on at Twitter right now. And regardless of whether you think the new owner is better or worse than the old owner, it seems there's broad consensus that it's not exactly great that a vital communications platform, how much you like it and how much value you get out of the service, is dependent on who owns it. This does not seem like a great state of affairs. So there's been a lot of conversations about, well, what alternatives do we have? It's been a known problem for many years that most of the big social media platforms don't really face competition and are functionally monopolies. This is due to, uh, as writers like Cory Doctorow have put it, the switching costs. It is very difficult to leave social networks because it basically involves saying goodbye to everyone you know on the network. Unless they go with you. <laughs> Unless they go with you, right. And so really what this talk is about is about emerging services that are proposing alternatives. Specifically, you may have heard talk about Mastodon, and you, you know, some of you may even be like, well, what really is that? And that's half of why you're here. We hope you'll learn more about it by the time you leave. But specifically, even beyond Mastodon, Mastodon is powered by a much broader principle of federation involving new social media protocols, specifically in this case one called ActivityPub. But the basic idea is a lot of activists, and I think we all count ourselves among them, think that social media would work a lot better if it was a federated technology much the way email is. And that's really what stuff like Mastodon is aiming to do. So without further ado, I'm going to let our two uh, illustrious speakers take it from here and educate us a little bit about um, where should social media on the internet go from here. Take away, gentlemen. Yeah, I don't really know anything. Honestly. <laughs> Smart guy. He's fine. He's fine. But uh, yeah, I, I was thinking a minute ago about uh, an IEEE meeting um, that I went to. IEEE engineers here in Austin, and they invited me to give a talk on the future of the internet, which I had been given around place to place. And, uh, when I showed up, I had this future of the internet presentation. And part of it was talking about the past of the internet, some of the past uh, technologies. And once I got into the talk, we couldn't get past the past. Everybody was on a nostalgia trip. And that was really all we could talk about. I never got to the future part of it at all. We, uh, every time I mentioned some old technology, you know, Waze or FTP or whatever, people would start popping up with their stories about it. Anyway, so tonight, uh, Tom and I agreed that uh, I would start by talking about history a little bit. And um, it's probably not going to be anything that you don't already know, but just to kind of set the frame. The internet was always social. Um, I think some of the first activity you saw on the internet very earliest internet when it was dark and that was people exchanging messages online. So exchanging messages, sharing information is kind of what it's all about. So the social internet is really just the internet. The internet was inherently social. And the history of that social development is really pretty interesting. I don't have time to, to I'm not going to go over it in, in any detail, but uh, I will mention that there's a book by a guy named Kevin Driscoll called Modem World. And Modem World talks about the impact of bulletin board systems on the evolution of the internet. It's a great book. I really suggest it. Uh, and one of the things that he talks about in that book is FidoNet. Anybody, you all know FidoNet? So FidoNet was created by a guy named Tom Jennings who, uh, um, has been here before, well, not at one of these meetings, but he's given a talk or two here in Austin. Uh, Tom was uh, um, just looking for a way to, I mean, he knew that there were BBSs, and he thought that they should be networked somehow. So FidoNet was kind of a system that created a network 
for bulletin board systems. And there were other bulletin board systems that did the same kind of thing. So on bulletin board systems, it was all pretty much conversation. Even like Illuminati, uh, the bulletin board system that Steve Jackson here, the one that got carted off by the Secret Service, was used for play testing, but it also people just hung out there and talked to each other, right? Uh, BBSs were a place to hang out. Uh, Usenet similarly was a place to hang out. With, with BBSs, what they did was, you had Fidonet, but they had other things like, there was what was called World War IV Net or WivNet, which uh, was another way to network bulletin board systems. The thing was to use uh, the internet as a backbone for swapping messages between the bulletin board systems. So you have a, a bunch of BBSs that were uh, sharing email over the internet. They would just uh, periodically dial up the internet. Um, you remember dialing up the internet? <laughs> in order to exchange messages. So that was, um, that was the early social life of the internet. One of those bulletin board systems is one that I've been part of for over 30 years <coughs> called the Well. And Well is for whole earth electronic, without an E, just electronic leak. It was started by the Point Foundation, which was the foundation that was set up by the people who made the Whole Earth Catalog. And the people who made the Whole Earth Catalog had got very involved in uh, technology through various paths that they took. And uh, they started publishing something called the Whole Earth Software Catalog. In addition to their Coevolution Quarterly Whole Earth Review, they had this software thing that they were, were publishing for a while. And they got the idea to set up a bulletin board system that was kind of a big one, you know. They put it on a big server. <clears throat> it was in the Bay Area. And the way that they populated the thing early on was, one, they invited <coughs> writers and journalists, um, people who were already skilled communicators to be part of it. But the other thing was deadheads. Grateful Dead had its huge following in the Bay Area, as you can imagine. And the followers of the Grateful Dead came on to the well through, there's a guy named David Gans who was connected with the Grateful Dead and became a member of the well and is still there. He's still a very active member of the well. And uh, um, there was like this huge community of Grateful Dead people who did all sorts of things in their day to day. They all kind of came on, onto the well. So the well kind of grew and became kind of a big deal. And early on, uh, as the internet was starting to uh, mainstream a bit, the well was early to connect to the internet. And people then could tell that into the well, which was, it was like just a command line system initially, the well was. It has a web interface now, but uh, for a long time, it was just a PicoSpan command line. So they would log onto the well, and um, uh, people would tell it into the well, which meant that people like me who were not in the Bay Area had a, a relatively cheap or free way to connect to the well, um, which changed our experience quite a bit. And the next thing you know, the well has all kinds of writers and journalists from all over the country on it. And there's Similar systems popping up in New York. There was one called Echo, and there was another one called Mindbox. So you had not just a lot of little bulletin board systems, but a few kind of big ones that were starting to build communities beyond the borders of their local area. And after that, uh, as people started coming onto the internet more and more, uh, you had a lot of content sites starting to appear, and they developed content, content management systems to make it really efficient to add content to these sites. Um, and then uh, the internet went away. There was a, in 2000, there was a dot-com bust, and the word was that the internet had just been a fad, <laughs> that there wasn't going to be anything happening on the internet much anymore. 
Nobody was certainly going to put any money into it because you couldn't make any money on the internet. We'd already proved that. So many businesses had kind of sunk because they, you know, advertisers stopped advertising because they didn't think that they were really getting that much visibility through the internet. So the people who had been using the internet a lot and still wanted to use it had to figure out some way to put their content online and people started building these more light personal con uh, content management systems like LiveJournal or Blogger or eventually WordPress. So you had a bunch of blogs appearing. And then some guys had this great idea that if you could blog just a limited number, like maybe no more than 140 characters at a time, you could like, it's kind of like messaging, but kind of like <coughs> posting a blog, but it's a little blog. They called it a micro blog. And they built Twitter for micro blogging. And actually, I think kind of the way they envisioned it initially was not the way it finally turned out. And they had some growing pains because of that. But Twitter became, as you all know, a really big deal. There was a lot of messaging going on um, through Twitter. And in addition to that, some other people uh, had seen, partly influenced by the existence of a site called Six Degrees back in the 90s. Six Degrees went away in 2000. Around the same time in 2000, another site um, appeared called Rise, R-Y-Z-E, -E, and it was kind of based on these business networking things that people have all the time. They said, well, people should be able to network like that online. So Six Degrees was kind of like the first social network like a site online where people could connect, like friend each other. And then you had uh, Rise. After Rise, a guy started a site called Friendster, which was really about like trying to get dates. He was trying to get dates for himself, but he built these things so that other people could do that too. You hook up online. And Friendster became a big deal for a while. And then uh, following Friendster, there was Orkut which was uh, a Google thing. A guy at Google had built this kind of in his spare time. And Orkut, I was telling Tom earlier the story about, you know, if you know about Orkut, you know that a lot of Brazilians showed up on Orkut. And that was my fault. <laughs> I was giving a talk to a conference in Rio de Janeiro. I was doing it from IC Squared here in Austin. They wanted to do this teleconference thing. So, Three or four of us went out to IC Squared and gave presentations that were, I think they had us on a big screen in an auditorium somewhere in Rio. And I was given a talk on social networks. And in the Q&A after that, somebody asked me if I could suggest a social network they might try. And of course I said Orkut because at the time that was my favorite social network. And damned if it wasn't overrun with Brazilians within a couple of months. It was crazy. <laughs> and that kind of tells you how things can happen on the internet. You know, things just spread. There's, you've got this virality. Uh, and people wanted to leverage that virality in order to make money. So you had other sites starting to emerge that kind of had an inkling of that idea. Facebook being one of them that was built for, you know, colleges, people at, at colleges, they had these things called Facebooks at colleges, and he kind of based it on that. Uh, this guy, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, in his dorm room, putting this thing together. And uh, I'm sure you all know the Facebook story, and I'm not going to rehash that, but you kind of see what has happened with that. So Facebook became a really big deal. Twitter became a really big deal. And that gets us to where we are today, where we have a few platforms that are big and popular and totally centralized and totally corporate and totally set up to work with one particular product and that's you and your attention and your content. So all of us who use these sites are contributing our content and our attention every day to help those guys make money. And uh, it's kind of exasperating when you think about it. A lot of people complain about it, but we keep going every day uh, onto those sites, onto those very centralized, very corporate networks. 
and uh, facilitating their riches. So Elon Musk then buys Twitter. And it happens that a few years before Elon Musk bought Twitter, back in 2016 or 17, I guess it was 16 or 17, that Eugene met. Oh, yeah, 16. Uh, so Guy builds a site called Mastodon. And he built it in the context of this thinking, indie web thinking. So indie web is a, kind of a movement a technology movement. Uh, the founders of it, I would say, are like Tantic Chelik and uh, Amber Case. They had uh, an indie web camp, and they did, I don't know how many, of them, three, four so far, or something like that. Oh, we, we had one here. Oh, yeah, here yeah. in Austin, we've got three. And there were others that. Them, yeah. So they started with one in, where were they? They were in the eastern part. Portland. Portland, yeah, Portland in the west. So they did one in Portland, and they did others after that. And basically, there were a bunch of people who came together who had the idea that the web should not be corporate, should not be centralized. It should be a lot of independent uh, technologies that were not built to make somebody a bunch of money, uh, and that were in some way able to share information with each other so you get that advantage of the internet, that ability to share data, that ability to share, you know, pictures and text and whatever. You know, movies, you know, uh, <laughs> little video clips, cat videos. Well, we all, we all kind of feel exasperated that we're having to go to these big corporate sites, but what are you going to do about it? IndieWeb is going to try to solve that problem. Uh, a lot of the people who got involved with IndieWeb early on were people who understood technology pretty well. So part of the question is how it gets mainstreamed. Elon Musk helped that along because when he bought Twitter and started alienating people uh, by being an asshole, basically, on Twitter, I shouldn't say that. This is streaming. Elon, I don't think you're an asshole. Not really. <laughs> so, so, and you know, some people find the direction of Twitter pretty obnoxious. And you've got people who might have been dissatisfied with that, but where were they going to go? Where were they going to be able to find all of their friends? That, that's the problem that we mentioned earlier. Uh, it's difficult to move from social, one social network to another because there's a question of whether your friends are going to go with you. Well, everybody started moving to Mastodon. Not everybody yet, but a lot of people on Twitter have moved to Mastodon. Now, there are other alternatives to uh, um, Twitter. Um, think about like Post.net is another one that, that I tried. and. Um, Counter social, counter dot social. But Mastodon was there and it was really similar to Twitter and people felt comfortable going there. Um, now, I had people, I kept hearing people say, Mastodon's really hard, it's really difficult. And I couldn't understand why because I got on Mastodon real fairly easily. I yeah. literally got EFF Austin on there today. It took me 15 minutes tops. Right on. And the interface isn't too bad, right? Uh, it's similar to other things you've used. It shouldn't be that hard. Uh, so I asked one of the people who was telling me this, I said, why, tell me why it's hard for you and, and I'll try to help you. Can you guess what it was? I mean, that you have to pick a server? Bingo that you have to pick a server and that you have to figure out which server to pick. So I think that when people say Mastodon is hard, what they're really saying is, why do I have to pick a server and how am I going to decide, you know? Is your rebuttal, well, why do I have to pick an email provider? Well, that is actually a good one because that's the best analogy is that this is sort of like email in that sense. You can have email accounts all over the place, but emails being traded among all of the systems. And this is a federated system, 
and it does that sort of thing. All the information's being shared. I can post something on an account. I have two accounts. One of them is for Plutopia, uh, which is our podcast. Um, Plutopia has a Mastodon account on home.social, and then I have a personal account on a server that somebody on the well set up for members of the well. I post something on the Plutopia account and it's right there on the other account, even though it's an entirely different server, it's got to go through a network and so forth, but it's fast, you know, it's reasonably fast. Some, some of those lower, like bandwidth servers are probably a little slower, but, you know, it's not tricky it's, and, and it works pretty well. And I think that Mastodon may be the thing that gets people into using systems that are indie web systems. And that's, this is a good time for me to hand it over to Tom because he's going to tell you about the actual technology. All right. Um, I'm Tom Brown and I've uh, been involved with indie web probably for five or six years. Um, I was first exposed to it. Um, I think like in 2012, Evan Prodromo had like a Fediverse kind of social meetup in San Francisco and I was fortunate to attend. And I first started hearing um, some of the ideas of uh, Tantic Shellac and Aaron Parecki. And um, one of the things that really stood out that Tantic said that I'll never forget was, um, he said, you know, people don't care about decentralized things. They just want something that works. And so you have to like really kind of focus on, on uh, usability and stuff. And that's kind of one of the core principles of the Indie Web is focusing on usability over protocols. Whereas uh, kind of the Fediverse is, I, I would argue that maybe it's a little bit of the opposite of that. They kind of uh, prioritize the protocols first, which, which has, has some benefit. Um, but some other things about the Indie Web is they encourage uh, plurality of projects so that there's lots of experimentation and you're not getting stuck into one, one product or whatever. Um, the idea of owning your own domain is a big deal. Uh, t to me, uh, personally, the biggest thing for me was um, uh, being able to communicate across different servers so that you're not, everyone's not trapped on the same domain. And indeed, that's one of the things that the Fediverse and Mastodon allows is that kind of cross-server communication. So I'm definitely a supporter of, of the Fediverse. Um, and, and, in a, and a lot of, I'm going to try to go through the, this technical stuff uh, uh, regarding Mastodon and Fediverse pretty quickly to make sure that there's time for questions and kind of interactive kind of sharing of experiences with, with Mastodon. Um, a, lot, a lot of the questions, uh, you, you can assume that any questions I answer will be, uh, uh, it depends because all of this is open source and uh, oftentimes um, when you're trying to kind of kind of figure out and learn about what's really going on in the Fediverse, you, it's you can't assume that uh, all these servers are running the same configuration or even the same software because they might be forks or different projects that speak that activity pub together. Um, so it's very uh, interesting and challenging, but a lot of a lot of fun. Um, so um, the. One of the main technologies uh, of, of the Fediverse is, is Webfinger. And I, I want to say that Webfinger's been around since like 2010-ish, as far as you know, people having conversations about it. I, actually, earlier than that, because I, re I remember uh, getting laughed at once in 2009 at a, at a wedding. There were some tech, techies from the Bay Area that came to a wedding here, and I, I was kind of enthusiastic about Webfinger, and they started laughing about the idea. But, the idea of Webfinger is, is uh, you, you take an email like looking address, like uh, say Tom at Mastodon.social, and then a, a, a client can uh, ask Mastodon Social who's Tom, and then uh, the server will respond with, with some uh, um, resource URLs that now are available as an API uh, can be, request can be made on, on that uh, web resource. And, and so, um, uh, for instance, in Mastodon, um, there's a well-known URL called dot, uh, you know, slash dot 
dash slash dot well dash known slash web finger and um, you pass it a, a resource uh, parameter and you say you give it this URI which begins with account ACCT colon and then your um, email looking thing and then the, the server responds with um, uh, a list of URLs but the main one uh, uh, the client will use to get more links is there's a self uh, URL and that's the one it'll it'll fetch that let me see do I have a slide on that no um, and then it'll it'll come back with a, a, a bunch of URLs like your inbox um, it'll, it, it'll, it'll give you a public key which we'll discuss discuss what that's uh, used for later um, and then just a ton of there's it's just a huge response of, of information about the user some of their preferences and things like that I just wanted to mention there, there was a thing like called a finger in yeah. Unix, and that's where the finger and web finger comes from. It's, it's where you get data about somebody. And if you don't mind me saying, what you just described looks popularly in Unix. Oh, uh, it, it, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, the, it depends on DNS for, for the domain uh, lookup. Um, and, and, but it, uh, instead of looking up a host, you're, you're looking up a user account, right? Well, you have a bunch of fields, like you have a C name, you have more firms, and you have a certificate. You're oh, yeah. Seconds, yeah, so you can think of it like that. So, yeah, instead of getting fields for, for a, a domain, you're, you're getting uh, fields for a, a email. Yeah, yeah, person, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so Finger, Finger was great fun back, back in the day, uh, especially with the Morris worm and the uh, Finger D uh, issue there. Um, which I think was 1988, um, and uh, that's a fun story. Um, and Activity Pub is is, is uh, another. So 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 the Fediverse uh, as we know it today depends on Webfinger, so that people can find each other. So um, I, those of you who have uh, logged in to say Mastodon mm -hmm. have probably done a search on a, on a Webfinger uh, identifier, and it's very easy to find people, and that's that's just. So, so, such a nice feature to support the Fediverse. So is essentially the at name in front of the at server is the web finger. Right. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly it. And so, yeah, pe people when they're doing that search, they don't realize they're using web finger, but that's that's what's happening. Um, and then then the second technology uh, that the Fediverse depends on is is ActivityPub, and and um, and then I've got it, the, kind of the main URL there, but. Uh, there was an article, I think it was like around 2019, um, by Darius Kazemi, which is really helpful because he, he like, you know, started looking at the activity pub spec and, it, you know, it could be kind of a grueling uh, deal. So he, he had this blog post, a highly opinionated guide of like how to, how do you learn about activity pub? And he has some great suggestions about starting with the vocabulary first, you know, like follow and and all the, you know, there's a long list of verbs, and, and then he tells you exactly which sections you should read next and stuff. So it's a, it's a really helpful uh, article by Darius, and he, he's uh, the one who created a very, what he calls lightweight fork of Mastodon called Hometown, and kind of the main feature of that is that um, it allows you not to federate your, your messages, your posts. It also can stay at the, in your little hometown server. So you're using Mastodon, but just kind of as a standalone uh, thing, um, and then uh, so so these uh, challenges of decentralization are just things that I've experienced and thought to myself, wow, this is much different than like Twitter or whatever, because we have these new problems that are have arisen because because of decentralization, and so um, the the first one I notice is that oh wow, it's like really easy to forge like timestamps and stuff to like make people think that your post uh, was made earlier than it really was. So, so I, uh, admin of a particular uh, Fediverse instance like Mastodon um, can control what's happening on his, his, his server, but he's, you know, being federated and stuff, he's accepting this information from other servers and there could be malicious administrators or, or stuff, and so he cannot trust any of that information because, uh, and we'll go into some some of the uh, funny <laughs> business and stuff later. 
but there's so many things that a malicious administrator from another server can do to to send people bad information or impersonate uh, people, and it's really uh, a, a new kind of challenge. It's, I mean, it sounds fairly equivalent to the early days of email of header fraud on the emails. Yeah, 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 but yeah. But same same kind of uh, federated uh, uh, architecture and same same crop of, of issues. Well, we still see this. The courts won't accept a text message as evidence. You have to go to your provider, get actual information about what the timestamp was, whether this text message was accepted, et cetera. So yeah. it's really a common problem, especially if you, God forbid, have a court case. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, um, I, I'm not even prepared to go into the legal <laughs> legal issues. Wait, yeah, not, not legal advice, I'm educated. <laughs> As we will have a court case soon enough because of what I said about Elon Musk. Make me feel nothing. Yes. And then, um, if if your um, server is down, uh, that that you're uh, associated with is uh, goes down during that time that it's down, you uh, will never see the messages from the other servers that were, you know, trying trying to reach you because. Uh, it's a, it's a push model, and, and if you're not available when, when that uh, message was pushed, then you, you've, you, you'll never see it on your server. Um, and, then, uh, and then this actually took me a while to figure out, it's like remote search. Since I'm on mastodon.social, um, uh, it has a lot of users, so it, it's a, a good percentage of the Fediverse I mean, a significant percent of the Fediverse. So I, I, I wasn't able to really uh, kind of understand how search works uh, until recently. Um, but search works on with hashtags, and that, that's uh, how, how uh, Mastodon does searches. Go ahead. Oh, oh I think you were raising a hand. I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so the remote search results there. Uh, so it seems like if I were the admin of a server, a Mastodon server, I would just create a, a, a fake user and follow everybody I can yeah, sure. just so that the remote search results will be as rich as possible that, for my server. That's correct. There are some bots that do that, actually. So, okay. They just so, go around and follow people, like, just follow everybody they can to try and build yeah. out the network on that server. Just so you, your search results, is there any other side effects of that, or is it just search I, I'm not sure to be honest. Although I'm sure you have to get to this, that's kind of a dangerous thing to do because then your server is caching a copy of everything, and you're going to run out of space real quick. And also, who knows what those servers have? Yeah, that's so why it's I would say the pocket goes and that does, does that. But well, space is pretty cheap. But I'm worried about that little server that I'm on keeps running out of memory, and crash. I don't know. How big is it? Uh, I don't know how big it is. It. So, I, like I said, somebody who's on the well just kind of set this thing. Actually, she's got it on AWS. I don't really know what the, it seems like it would scale. So well, I'm not really sure what's going on with it, because she says All the scale on AWS works perfectly, and they don't have a cap on your price pending, so. Oh, there you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to say, that that, and maybe, maybe you can speak to this, Tom, but some of the issues I heard people reporting is that the way the, uh, the sort of multi-threading of tasks in Mastodon works, it seems that you run into problems if somebody has a ton of followers and starts getting in multiple conversation threads with like a hundred of those followers because it blasts a job to everyone following the account for each The George Sky yeah. Syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, so like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So, so another question on the second one, you say you will miss posts originating from the servers if your server is down. So it doesn't queue them, it's just like, it, it's, it's a, like a scheduled push, and if you're not there, it doesn't happen? Yeah, I, I, it uses a sidekick to, to send out these messages to everybody. And so I haven't actually looked at the configuration. Um, but just through experience, I, I know that it, it doesn't retry it for forever. So my, my guess is, is maybe there's some kind of window that it retries for 10 or 15 minutes. But after that, game over. And I assume that like the server admin could in theory do manual sure. pulls of other servers, but if you're if the server's down and your admin doesn't choose to do that of re poll the other servers for that time period, you're out of luck, basically. Right. So so I don't want to derail your No, go ahead. Uh, just the, the, uh, it kind of seems like uh, the admin 
or invent a mass cloud server sort of like the, the Elon Musk's. Yes. You know, they, 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 kind of like, well, <laughs> they can just sort of decide, oh, I'm going to delete this post, I don't like it. I, I think they probably would do that, but they could. Well, they could. Or, they or, or, uh, or they could um, delete a post from another I'm server. I'm holding all the accounts hostage because I've decided to, you know, wait, I'm waiting for the apocalypse, whatever. It yeah. Is, you know. I mean, definitely it is a real concern, although technically you have that risk. Twitter or any centralized service as well. Uh, well, I mean, but it, things like you know Facebook and Twitter, you know, they, these are they they are highly paid engineers who are not uh, they're not hired to be a, they're they're not in the opinion or vetting business. Well, right. That's why you never hear about that. You never hear oh the Facebook engineer shut them. You know. Well, right. It, out. it depends really on what you join. Because again, if you, if you join a small server without a large team, you on the one hand, you're shaping your community. On the other hand, you know, like Mastodon Social does have paid engineers, but yes, some of these smaller servers do not. So you know, there's pros and cons of everything. But one thing I will make clear before I hand it back is, is yes, do not, just like Twitter, but this is in no way private. Server admins are God and can read everything. So you should yeah. definitely use Signal for sensitive peer-to-peer -peer communication. Do not use this for sensitive information. It's social media. It's public. Servers got the server admins God. They see everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a great great point. Uh, the admins have complete control over, over their particular server, and and can do all kinds of uh, funny stuff. There is no security for the data interest at all. Um, I, I, again, uh, the answer is it depends on, on Mastodon. Uh, if you have database access, uh, you know, like console access to the server, you have access to all the data. Yeah, it's definitely not. It's not zero knowledge or anything like that. No, okay. it's, it is not. not but just the regular like strong passwords, SSH keys, like that stuff would apply if you set them up. But but, but the shard just for the actual the actual database entries are not. And I'm referring to the theory. correct. Any any admin who logs into the database can see all your messages and everything. They're not end to end encrypted or anything. Yeah, like that. When Amazon you kick off the gap, then all the user clicks are exposed and just spread correctly picking the URLs so. there. Users all the internet network by addressing the proper S3 bucket, we were able to pull it up. If they have access to the database, yeah. Uh, which was torn down and exposed. Uh, that wouldn't well. surprise me. Amazon is usually the number one culprit for data breaches. Well, not to mention they just don't put it as default. They don't. Yeah, S3 default is horribly unsorted. Yeah, they, it, it's an infamous problem. The defaults are not what they should be. I mean, it sounds like as a server admin for Mastodon, you could do fun things with trying to encrypt your stuff and even going so far as to being able to provide that to users, but that gets into its own, you know, are you providing your own uh, uh, server for users, and are they going to pay you for it? Well, right, and, and it gets into weird questions about why do you want to be on a small server, like, because if you're wanting a very tailored moderation experience on a small server, and everything's in the encrypted, your admins literally suddenly can't provide that for you anymore. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um. De definitely, the uh, uh, lot, there's lots of possibilities there, um, and, and just kind, kind of in, in terms of like uh, governance and stuff. Um, there is like a, a emerging cooperative in Canada that are uh, trying to make governance stuff a little bit uh, easier, and then also you know uh, sustainability uh, of, of the of the servers, which which is really cool. Um, so. Uh, just to kind of describe uh, the, the, the search deal is if you're on a, a server with just a few users and you search on a particular hashtag, you may only get like, you know, zero or one or two results of, of that hashtag. And that's because you're only going to see your, your local uh, posts from your local people or uh, posts that your local people are following from. and, and then. Uh, but if you're on Mastodon.social, you'll get, you know, it, it seems like you'll get 99% of, of the stuff just because of uh, the network effects there. You mean because there's so many people on that? Yeah, right. there's already over a million on Mastodon.social, mm -hmm. the main one. And then there, each one of them are following people from other remote servers, so it gets good coverage. It, it basically sounds almost like the, to answer the old question of what server should I choose, well if you really want kind of the Twitter global conversation experience, you should probably choose a large server. If you're really viewing it in some ways as a glorified 
disgorge uh, community or something, you might want a smaller one. Right. Yeah. But how do you make the user database consistent? If some small server has a user account to a certain name, and then that server goes down for 15 minutes, and during that 15 minutes, two more people are different than the world on their servers are registering the same user account, and then the first server goes back online. Oh, well, the e each user account is associated with a particular server. Oh, okay. So so the user account is, the, the name, like Tom, is only unique on that server. But globally, you can have infinite number of Toms. Very much like email. Yeah. yeah. Kind of yeah. Think of the server as like part of user, et cetera. And then, was there another <coughs> challenge? No, okay. Um, uh, then, uh, this is uh, just kind of a, a real quick run through of different security, <coughs> security things. Um, EFF has a post about uh, Mastodon security. Um, Mastodon has HTTP signatures. They've got like a, th this is a link to their, their documentation. And I'll, I'll explain why, what they're for. Um, but Mastodon also has two links here about kind of tutorials about how, how to build like basic functionality which require the, the HTTP signatures. Um, and, and the idea with the HTTP signatures is that um, when you are uh, sending any kind of activity pub command or message, uh, whether it's a message or it's a follow or whatever, you, you sign it so that the people, person on the receiving end actually knows that it's you. So when you get an account on, on Mastodon, uh, a key pair is generated for you, and so you sign every activity pub thing with your private key, and then the, the guy on the other end has got your public key and can verify that it actually came from you, so, so somebody else can't forge your messages. Um, but the problem is, and for some reason, Mastodon has not updated any of these last three, the, the two tutorial or the one documentation, that, that, that these three articles that I've just listed, they're all wrong. <laughs> they haven't been updated uh, to include changes that have made since, I guess, 2018 or 19 when that documentation was written. Um, because since then, the HTTP signatures uh, have added, because uh, before when they did these articles, they were just signing like the header stuff. Uh, you know, like your, the timestamp of your header, that it's like a, a post to, what, you know, what's the path that the, the post is going to. Um, but since then, they've, they've um, added um, that, that the body gets included in the signature. Because cause before you um, included the, the body, um, anybody could, it, it, uh, like a, a bad, you know, malicious server admin, could, could follow the, the victim who's, who's sending a message on their malicious server. They, they could get the, the message and, and, and the, they could just change the body of that message and, and re resend it and then send it to all the, that victim's followers. And because, uh, um, because the, the hash of, of the um, uh, of the message what was included in, in the um, in the signature, it, it's easy for that that malicious actor to do that. So so since since these articles were published, they they added that that you need to include uh, the hash of the of the the message into the signature, um, and that's that's required if you want to talk to a Mastodon server. You have to you have to you have to do that. Um, so yeah, the uh, digest of the document needs to be included in the signature. And then um, I've got a link to the, um, the, where the content security policy is configured uh, for Mastodon, which prevents uh, common uh, cross-site scripting attacks. And then, um, uh, as we've mentioned before, direct messages on Mastodon should not be considered private. Um, and then also I've, I've put a screen capture of my um, my active sessions. So if you go to like slash off slash edit of your server, you can see what your active sessions are. And then if there's old ones that you're not using anymore, you want to revoke those. Um, but and you can also detect any weird activity that's not supposed to be there. Somebody's coming in from Russia or whatever. <laughs> um, and then another thing is, uh, you, you may have noticed when you visit somebody's profile on Mastodon is, is if they've added a, a link 
Sometimes, you know, like a, a URL, the personal URL, sometimes it's that link is highlighted in green. It's like a check mark verification. And what you, what you need to do to, to get that is just go to your uh, the HTML page for your URL and add a realme link that points back to your, your server. And then Mastodon will, will see that it's pointing back and they'll verify you. Um, again, the, the trouble with this is, is that since it's open source, uh, a malicious admin on their server can easily add their own green check mark to, to anything. So you gotta make sure you trust the server who's, uh, who's, who's displaying the profile um, before you can trust the, the check mark, the green check mark. Um, and then uh, here are some uh, links uh, about um, one, of, one of the most important things about Mastodon is if you're um, unhappy or for whatever reason you want to move your account from one server to another, it's very easy to do so and they automatically uh, bring your followers over to, to the new thing. Uh, on, on your new system you, ha you have to like uh, declare an alias, uh, say what your old server is and then on the old server you like initiate the move and the old server will automate um, well, we'll shut down your account, we'll freeze your account, and while it's doing that, it'll move your followers over to the new stuff. You have to manually uh, export who you're following, and then you can manually uh, upload to the new place who you're following, but uh, at least your followers don't have to refollow you, so it's, it's, it's a really nice uh, deal. Um, and, and that kind of goes along the lines of uh, the concept of trust agility that Moxie Marlin Spike coin, which is, uh, you know, you, you don't want to be trapped in one server, and Mastodon makes it easy for you to move uh, from one server to another. What if you want to move back? You can move back as well. Unless, um, of course, the old server you used to be on decides you're a bad actor and doesn't want you back. Anymore. Yes, they, 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 can, they can block <laughs> you're you. You're still on there, in effect, because you... Yeah, you can leave the old... Yes, that's exactly yeah. right. You can leave the old account uh, there. You kind of have to. I mean, you just like this, right? Right. But you eventually, uh, you have the uh, option to close it down afterwards. So uh, I guess you could, and you could remove the alias, go back to the old account, remove the alias, and then pull everybody back. Is that what you would do? You you just perform the same series in reverse. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. And then the, this third link is particularly good because it it goes into a little bit more technical detail than the first two. The first two is more like a kind of user experience of, of doing it, or the third one actually gets you into the nuts and bolts. Um, and so yeah, here's, here's uh, on the new server, uh, you go to settings, aliases, and you just, you tell it what your old account is, and that's how you uh, get the thing in motion, and then you go to your old server and you tell it to initiate the, the move. Um, and then uh, there's, a, um, along the lines of the IndieWeb, uh, there's, there's this idea of publish on your own site, and syndicate, syndicate out to like Twitter or, or whatever. Usually it's like a, a corporate site, but in this case you, you can uh, publish on your own blog and you can make a copy of your post to go to Mastodon and, and Bridgie allows this um, in theory. Um, and, uh, and, and so what Bridgie does is it, it on, on the Indie website it, it talks web mention and on the Mastodon side it talks activity pub and it just does does it let you have conversations between your blog and uh, Mastodon? Um, I did. There's an open issue right now that, that is uh, causing a problem that they're hoping to fix on Mastodon with with the uh, with Bridgie. Um, and then uh, and then there's it would also uh, be nice uh, if there was web mention support in, in Mastodon. So the first issue is is uh, you know hoping that. Uh, if, if people, uh, when they have, when they include links in their posts on Mastodon, it would be nice if uh, Mastodon could send a web mention out to the blog or whatever uh, to let them know that somebody on uh, Mastodon has mentioned them. And then the second one is the, the reverse. It's like, oh, um, can, uh, can, can Mastodon, you know, receive uh, web mentions? So the blog on the other side would also have to be web mention capable, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, and yeah, and so that's probably one of the reasons that the issues haven't been closed is because um, not enough people are using web mention. And then uh, uh, 
the Fediverse is not just Mastodon. Um, the first link is really helpful. It's like a list of all uh, the different projects that support Mastodon, at least, at least to their knowledge. Um, or not, they don't support Mastodon, but they support ActivityPub. Uh, it's what I mean to say. And then uh, I mentioned Hometown is, is a light fork of, of Mastodon. Um, and then PixelFed is a photo site, Sports Activity Pub. Miss Key is, uh, I hear they've got like a really cool user interface. Friendica was like originally StatusNet, which was like Evan uh, Perdomo's original site. And then last but definitely not least is Micro.blog, which is um, made here in Austin. And it's actually, um, uh, the best uh, uh, combination of IndieWeb and the Fediverse. So, so it allows. Is, is Manton still running the project? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And and Man Manton was like the main organizers, uh, main organizer of the three IndieWeb camps that we've had here in Austin between 2017 and early 2020. That EFF Austin has been very supportive of. Um, but he project. We want to keep seeing what you guys build. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. Uh, Lenny. Lenny's great. It's, it's the first one I've actually used. It's like Reddit. Lemmy is the federated Reddit, basically. Yeah, yeah it's like an open source Reddit, federated Reddit. And There's I also assume peer subreddits are literally different okay, servers yeah. on Lemmy. Like, no, no. I don't know. It, it, has, it has servers that can, it still has like, you know, they call them communities, which for some reason is a little bit harder to, I feel like it's a little bit vague. Subreddits is a little bit more specific. So, mm -hmm. but anyway, yeah. It, 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 the community stuff, so, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that micro.blog uh, was or originally like a very, um, uh, um, it, it, it wasn't originally supporting ActivityPub, but it, it quickly added that, and uh, I really like the, um, uh, the way it's done that. It, but it also, uh, it, it um, makes us realize how, how different blogging and, and um, microblogging are. Uh, because in microblogging, you know who your followers are, but like blogging, you don't. And and Manton, with micro.blog, has had this idea that he, uh, the pe people don't need to see who their followers are. You know, it needs to be more like a blog. But now that he's supporting ActivityPub, he, uh, micro.blog is in this interesting um, a gray area where um, people have this expectation to know who their followers are when they're connected to the Fediverse, but micro.blog doesn't show the followers. But in any case, micro.blog is a, a super site that um, it, it is, uh, really has good integration. So micro.blog is a, is a model that like... Yes, that's correct, but it, it talks IndieWeb and ActivityPub. Are all the other ones up there the same? Are they also... Um, when you say monolith, what do you mean exactly? Uh, I mean that I cannot go and, and take their software and create a... Oh, okay, it's, uh, micro.blog is closed source, and whereas the other ones, my, uh, in general, are open source. No. I, I could be wrong on some of them. Some I know of them might be and PixelFed are. I'm not sure about the other two. Okay, yeah. Is, is micro.blog, though, a, a fork of the, um, of no. the activity pub? Oh, so it really is his whole other right. code. Yeah. It, it speaks the protocol, yes. speaking the shared common protocol. Correct. It's his own input. Correct. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like anybody can build a system and put it in their protocols, and it can still be a closed system. Uh, I mean, it's not closed in that sense, but. Right, right. Contained, maybe. You know, SMTP and other stuff. Oh, protocols. question? Uh, a couple of years ago, I went to a meetup that Manson hosted. I don't remember the name, but it was really good. I don't know if that's the little thing. It was an indie web meetup, yeah. What was it called? Indie, anyway, Tom and... Yeah, it was originally... All did that. Um, for, uh, like, I think the first three or four years we did it, we called it Homebrew Website. And then, like, just at 2020, before we shut everything down, it was, uh, we uh, briefly called it the Indie Web Meetup, but mostly home, Homebrew Website. Um, you know, I guess I'll say that uh, if Manton and the gang ever get them going again, just let us know. Well, we definitely like to direct people to them as social events when they were happening, so definitely let us know if that starts up again. Okay. That homebrew is an important kind of thinking, you know, it's like, it used to be, uh, early on there was a thing, we went through a period where people were just building their own websites, and, you know, maybe they do it with a content management system, or maybe they just set up a website or whatever. 
Uh, and then we got into all this centralized stuff where everybody's on a big corporate platform and putting all their content there. So the idea here is that you brew your own website. You, it's a homebrew thing. Like you build your own website. You build it the way you want it to be. Maybe use something like WordPress or whatever. But it's yours and it's custom for you. But you can also put it on the network. So uh, you get what happened to uh, WT.social? I don't know anything about that. Okay. That was one of the earlier ones. I kind of ran around the Mastodon time. Well, the earliest one of these let's all leave okay. Facebooks I remember was Diaspora. No idea if that project was still running. It's on the network. It still exists. I don't know if it's still being developed. WT.social, I mean, every once in a while I did a message. I created a, an account. You know, I don't know what it was, four years ago, I can't really remember. Uh, and they seem to be of that, you know, federated, uh, you know, let's do this right. It, it might be on that first link. I, I, it's a really long list of. Oh, there it is. Okay, okay. yeah. I, I, what was it? WT.social? WT, just two letters. Is that the one that Jimmy Wells set up? <laughs> Uh, oh, I, I have a somewhat technical question. So, the identity portion of the Fediverse is basically managed by the web finger stuff. Is that correct? Yeah. So, I guess my question for you is: is so you have different activity pub Fediverse implementations? You know, you have Mastodon, but you you have all these other ones, Lemmy, whatever, etc. Um, and with the web finger for identity, I mean, we've talked about it's not hard to move your identity from one Mastodon server to another, is there any ability to assert shared identity across Fediverse services? Like, could I say this Lemmy account is the same identity as the person on this Mastodon? Yes, yeah, there's uh, like a, I think it's called like also known as or, or something like that, but that's what the aliases are, uh, use, there's that field. So, so in theory, and this actually sounds potentially really cool and potentially transformative, which we aren't even talking about. In the Fediverse, you could essentially define a single identity across every service you use, and you don't have to keep making a new account for every service, essentially. Is that true? I'm not sure I understood. So, like, for instance, I, right now, if I can't reuse my Twitter account on Reddit, I have to go make a Reddit account. Right. In theory, I oh. can reuse my identity across these services. It depends on what you mean by identity. So, when I well, I guess, I guess, I guess uh, this is almost, almost a protocol question. So, like, at the web finger, what is tied to the identity and what isn't? Oh, uh, well, there's the there's the notion of the identifier, which is you know Bob at domain, and and that's really uh, that's the unique identifier, which uh, which is what matters. Okay. Is you support the idea at all? Uh, uh, the, the closest thing to old OpenID 2.0 is, is IndieAuth, uh, which which is what the IndieWeb community uses. Um, oh, uh, there's OpenID Connect, which is completely not related to OpenID, um, but but IndieAuth is the is the one that's got the most momentum. That is the most like old OpenID. Yeah. Jimmy Wales yeah, Jimmy Wales created this thing, and it's it's an alternative to Facebook and Twitter too, but it's not on the Fediverse. So I'm talking about the identity question. One thing I kind of wondered. I'm a designer, so I'm, like I know about enough development stuff to avoid developers, but not like you know. So I'm not. I'm asking this question because I don't actually exactly haven't done a satisfactory answer to it, but like. It definitely seems like a big problem with a lot of the Fediverse stuff is that it's it's just really annoying. If you want to go call someone on like another server, you have to like copy and paste their thing into the thing. It, it's, you can't even do it in the app at all. Like it's, it can be very frustrating. Yeah. You know? But uh, you know, Solid, which is a uh, Timber Lee, you know that 
I, I don't know, is that a solution? Is it something, there, there's been talk of That's people. sort of kind of what I was asking, whether this all slots into projects like solid of like a bundled digital identity where you control your data and you move between these services and you, you don't have to keep like using email or whatever as your authentication to prove who you are, like you have direct control over who you are or don't want to be. I know that there's been some discussion about it on activity of Ross form, which I saw linked earlier, but it as far as I can tell, it's gone nowhere. And I'm just kind of curious if that's like a is that a technical problem? Is am I just like you know be like, oh this thing sounds kinda of like this thing, and maybe they go together and they don't actually like integrate at all <coughs> so this means you're I I get the sense that Solid's still kinda of in the ideation phase. I do too. I don't know how far along it is. It doesn't sound like the tools have been built for that. I think that's usually the problem that we run into. The current identify, sorry, identification providers we have are private companies because somebody's using that data for money. And that's why they exist. That's why they have a huge amount of money put into making people like me be able to go, oh, yeah, I want to use Okta as my identification provider and you know, be able to do that quickly and easily with JavaScript tutorials. If Solid or other things hit that point, they might be able to help with the Mastodon. That's a fine way of doing it. Central identification provision should be able to integrate it, but someone's got to build that. Yeah, and I, then maintain. I'm just very curious how much this project and how close it is to helping with a related problem, which is the problem of account identity verification. Because, like for instance, we're already having instances where you know so many websites uh, you know use your email and your control of your email to validate identity. But now there have been increasing reports of stories of like, oh well, when you try to create an account with a service and your email is a Proton email, suddenly they won't let you because only hackers use Proton. Right. Yeah. Crunchable. Can you guys reiterate what the identity providers of uh, your choice? Look, the gentleman Mac mentioned Alter, which is one of the biggest identity providers in the, in the commercial space, and the identity, every server is effectively and I'm trying not to be very technical, but I am, is an IDP, is an identity provider, right? Can you federate those identity right. providers um, with inherited I, I trust mean, relationship and cross-server attribute passing? I, I can answer the question. Yeah. It's okay. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we encourage sure. discussion, so yes. <laughs> so, uh, right now in the world of self-hosting, there's this big subreddit called self-hosted. Um, the facto one that is used in Office for on-premise deployment to an you know, enterprise setting, the use one called Keyflow, is on my Red Hat. That currently is not federated, but it can have single sign on with multiple domains. Yeah, but the yes or so was my next question, right? Yeah, there you go. So it's called Keyflow. Okay. Again, I think this is a matter of managing to build a system that does this. Being able to federate is not, uh, it's, it's not easy. It's not it's a trivial. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not it's trivial, but it's not like we haven't done this. 15, 20 years. I mean, it, it, uh, Elasticsearch has been doing sharding for at least as long as I've had a career. So, you know. Right, a lot of it is just because we, in theory, know how to do it. Somebody still has to build it. Sure, and maintain and keep it up. I think that's the bigger right. problem. And then finally, you have to trust it. You have to choose that that federation is still acceptable to you. Because, as mentioned, especially, and this has been always a discussion on cryptocurrency for better or for worse, too, is if you control 50% plus of a crypto network, you can start doing fun tricks with whether those transactions ever actually existed. That's Even true. though it's federated. It, right. it, it doesn't matter if it's federated. If, if you have control over a network, you still have control over that federation. So, <laughs> well, in, theory, so in theory, we just hope federation is harder to gain control of than right. you should. But right, it's not impossible. No, and that's the thing is that you know, and can you also be even a malicious actor where you've shut down all your oh. competition too? John, John, you know, Elon's Which, very disappointed. Did you see this? I did see that actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I actually, see a lot of people I, uh, talking about that. And actually, when I looked at that tweet on the AFA Boston account, it was flagged with the automated, like, this might contain sensitive content. Are you sure you want to view it? And I clicked it, it's just your tweet. I, I like, think, there's no nudity. I feel really I think awful. they might have changed that. I appealed it. Maybe. I, I well, like I, I, I actually, as of an hour ago, it was still warning me it had sensitive content. So. I told them, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Exactly. <laughs> Suppressing of Mastodon of info, huh? Uh, sorry, speaking of being ashamed, do you have a native Tor support or any active Tor gateway? I don't. Do you know? Or any, any plans to support it? 
Oh, you for, know, I did hear some, hear some reference to Tor. Oh, yeah, like, fed, I guess federated Tor on Activity Pub, I guess, is the question. Yeah, I had never even thought about that. That's, that's interesting. I'm sure some of the instances probably have, like, Tor oh, addresses. Man, because, you know, <laughs> I'm sure some do, but not all of them. This is not Photoshop that you confirm. <laughs> What's the one that's kind of they're promising, uh, like the Twitter for news post? Post, yeah. I don't know anything about that. John, can you pull up the adoption curve for Mastodon over the last few weeks? Where can I find that? I don't know. Just look. <laughs> Ask ChatGPT. Seriously, Ask ChatGPT. It's been pretty astronomical. I can guarantee that. Uh, there we go. That says jumping off points. What is this? Oh, there you go. Hey. Wait, what happened to that? Where did it go? Oh, scroll down. It, it's it's embedded in the article. Is it down right the there. article? Oh, what is it? Well, I'll be damned. Oh, well, I mean, we know. We know there's a huge surge. Probably less than you would think. Servers were crashing all over the place. That's up to no I, it, it's actually funny with Masnick posting. I, I just followed Masnick on Mastodon with the FM Austin, and he was he had a, another comment to this effect. He was like, "People keep telling me Mastodon, nobody's here, except I'm already up to half my Twitter follower account. He, uh, account he's got twenty five thousand, and he says, and I'm liking the conversations here way better." Well, the, the interesting thing is, you get on Mastodon, and it's like. Going back to the old neighborhood, it's like the people that you used to hang out with online are there. They were all being buried in the Twitter noise, and now you can see them again. And you now know, we'll have a few months of glory before all the bots mm -hmm. start invading. Lately, I'm seeing some people <laughs> post about how they're actually getting better reach on Mastodon, even though they have fewer followers because there's no algorithm. There's no I, algorithmic timeline. That's the way I feel. I mean, I think people read my posts. Also, I find that on Mastodon, on Twitter, I didn't really necessarily follow somebody who followed me, but I'm following everybody back, and I think other people are doing that too. So I think it's it's a more uh, more symmetry in the connections, you know. Is that hand in the back? I have a question about the Mastodon adoption and the use cases. Um, I, I don't know too much about it, but I would assume that there are servers out there that are like geographically based, I guess, for lack of a better word. I mean, are there servers out there? I guess my question is, are there servers out there that are like family and friends? And, like, Definitely, yeah. Okay. But that's, is, that, is that like most of the update? <laughs> Oh, I don't think so. I, I think it's mostly affinity group, but there's definitely like like there's one in Montreal. Uh, for, there's one for Austin. Yeah, one for Austin. Okay. For the record, I haven't. I don't know anything about it. I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying there is one. Somebody set up one for Austin. And I mean, we were even debating setting up one of our own, but I was like, eh, I'm not sure we have the bandwidth. It sounds like a lot of work, and we wanted to just get on there. So we're on social for now. Yeah, there's <laughs> Med Dash Macedon for doctors. Um, <laughs> There's a couple infosec ones. Um, there's some like art ones, some social ad, activism ones. Yeah, I'm already starting to now that we're on there get a sense of some of the big ones because you start seeing the same uh, ads pop up again <laughs> and again. Yeah, there's an infosec one that seems, from what I can tell, at least by who we follow, almost as big as the main one. Infosec on exchange. Yeah. Yeah, they're like the main one. Any other server recommendations? <laughs> That's what we're here for, right? I, I, to pick I mean, a server. I mean, I mean, we're all here to pick I a mean, server. I mean, the, mo the moderators of social haven't been mean to me yet, so okay. so far so good. Cool. <laughs> Try harder. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> There's a lot of them out there. How about toot.funami. Yeah, see, on this one, on the actual Mastodon website, you can sort it by topic. So, like, they have some music ones. Journalism, food. Oh, this is a useful page. I've been looking yeah. for something, and we know they Didn't have. Didn't I send you that? How about you this? Did. Host you <laughs> asked you know, oh, yeah, busy I've been the last month. Here's That's one for, we haven't account at all. Here's one for people who like beer and free software. Oh, I got something. Oh, well, then we should go. I'm moving my account. <laughs> what page are you looking at here? Uh, joinmastodon.org slash servers. Yeah. There's a yeah, lot of them out the there. I did, and I Looks think like the list has changed since I last like looked. Epicure.social, how about that? Hey, Metalhead, I used to be on that one. So this is one way to look at it, but I want to see a network graph. Oh, that would be interesting, yeah. I'm sure someone's done it. So someone's put yeah. sizes and, and connections. Because that could theoretically be done now, right? That's mm -hmm. Facebook hides all that data, obviously. 
Well, it's because you can't have a We were hoping to see a management console of a sort, no Google search. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Let's see. Well, shoot. What is this? Yeah, that's from 2018. That's like oh, there we go. <laughs> That's kind of. I mean, it, I mean, if you if you can find the API documentation, if everybody's going to come back in a week, I'll run a shell script to do it for you. Oh, there's a bunch of. I mean, their install documentation is pretty straightforward. So I, mean, I don't know. Just poke around their docs for a few minutes. I want to keep the whole server busy with a job. This would be good if I could find it. <laughs> Yes, don't mind me servers, I'm just, it's not a DDoS, I'm just... Is there a button to, like, app. view the image itself, or <laughs> they view that? It would not come out, let's see. Hmm. What's this? This will make all all. That's an actual research go. paper. There we go, dense papers and yeah. charts, <laughs> this is what I'm talking <laughs> about. Yeah. Yeah. Is, hey, there it is. There, there it is. is. Can you right click and, like, open it in another... Does, right, what's probably. the resolution? No, I don't yeah. think I can. Yeah. Yeah. Where does can, yeah. can, can, can we put that into mid-journey and ask them to scale it up for us? <laughs> Where does the funding come from for all the, the I don't know what we call the central, uh, the central Mastodon hub stuff? That actually is an excellent question. Is what rich overlord is funding all this? I, I think the government in Germany gave them some kind go. of grant. <laughs> Um, he like set up a few a couple years ago as a nonprofit, so now he is eligible for grants. He can't sell it. I'm pretty sure he set it up. It's part of yeah. Germany's plot to take over the world. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> never happened. They're doing a great job. But uh, also keep in mind that uh, each each server is independently set up. So like, yeah. but but there's that. The main instance, I think he mostly gets it from uh, donations. I could be wrong, or it probably does get a lot of grants too because they're not. Um, he actually was in the blog post about a while ago. I mean, he's one of the only servers that well, somehow has enough money to pay the HWS fees for that many users. Wow. What's that? I can also tell you that that French one, Mammoth.fr, is the one Corey's on. Oh, he's on. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, he's oh. been on, because he's cool, he's been on Mastodon since like 27. Or even, maybe I want to say 20. He's been on there a long time. So. I've been on there since 27. Yeah. But I, you know, nothing was happening. Well, right. They didn't hadn't quite hit critical mass for there to actually be enough conversations going on. But we may have jumped it's a lot better with a million users. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, right. But with what you've presented so far, the, the cheerful crowd sees a lot of possibilities with fairly easy automation on how to make it profitable or exploitable enough to either harvest data or force the agenda of their, of their choice. I and mean, I'm, I'm sure we will see people trying to game this, you know, humans invariably do. <laughs> I right. think we ought to just I don't see like a, a, any checks and balances built in, which made, in, I see like five opportunities for implementation of X way. You know, so I've so thought about this, um, um, obviously, there's room for exploitation of the thing, but the question is, you know, how would how would the Fediverse react to attempts to turn it into an exploitation? I mean, potentially the way various email systems did, they had to get stronger spam filters, they had to get stronger with identity verification, because, I mean, you know, a lot of these problems happened in the early days of email, and there's you know, there's a reason that systems like Gmail have incredibly complicated workings behind the scenes. They used to prevent attacks on the network. I'm shocked that there's not a server called pornography.social yet. <laughs> oh, there might be. I, I, have you checked? I mean, I, I, are you saying there's no porn on this network? That is incredibly unlikely. Is there porn on the internet anywhere? <laughs> I didn't think there was. Porn was actually driving the vendors. Do you remember, so years ago there was this Time magazine cover about cyber porn, and we all really reacted to it, and we were saying, no, there's not a bunch of porn on the internet. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I had some people talking about it at my house, some people I knew, and I, being the smart internet guy, was going to go in there and show them that there was no pornography <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> Whoopsies. <laughs> it, what year I was, was wrong. this? What I was year wrong. was this? I don't know. It was probably 
early 2000s or something. No, it was earlier than that. It would have been in the late 1990s. Well, I just learned a lot about what corners of the internet you don't visit unless you're looking for them, John. And so, so, uh, um, so I, I, let's say I'm you know, the admin of a Mastodon server and I've got 10,000 users. There's another server, Mastodon server's got 10,000 users. Uh, and there's a, some user from that Mastodon server keeps posting crap on some user on my server, uh, can I block just that user? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Can I can I just block them just from posting on a specific user and not completely block? Them? Oh, what was the second question? So so Basically, I want to keep them from them posting. On on, I want to keep them from posting uh, or re responding to a user on my server. Uh, oh, on a specific oh, thread, but yeah. I, I just want to block that right. on that thread. I don't want to block him entirely. I think you can block a user. I don't think you can blog with that level of regularity. Yeah, you can block other users. Okay. 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 Um, you can also mute them where like they can still see you. And I think you can block other users, users yeah. whether they're on your server or not. Yes. Okay. Is there an option? I, uh, I think so. Yeah. I can just look. Well, because if there's a million people on uh, social and I want to block somebody else on social, that that's not very useful if only the admin can block them right. for me. I can unfollow, but can uh, I block? I, I was wondering if anyone had experience with a, a federated service called Bumpwheel. Yes. Yeah, it's like yeah, so what you do is, is basically you follow people and you have access to their library, their music library. And it's kind of like in the vein of Group Shark. Um, it's totally federated. Um, it's a pretty awesome service. I mean, it, it, it sounds a bit like an interplanetary file system, but just for music. With yeah, it's just so it's like a whole thing. It's just 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 a whole thing. It's 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 a whole thing. You can hide boosts, you can add to lists, remove from lists, whatever. Okay, it looks like you have one or which is less extreme. What happens if you use report? Well, mute allows, allows them to still see the your probably the remote. Okay, right, right. I use that one generally. And you can block the whole domain if you want to. So you have. And then report will actually report them to both servers. That sounds right. Yeah, that would well, that's how it works on uh, Pier 2. I get spam notifications all the time on my server from people that are not on my server. Like, the, the spammer is not on my server, but I still get a notification, so I can remove it from my users at least. But I don't know if the other server ever takes any action. But in theory, because it's reporting to, multi, to both servers, in theory, of a particularly bad actor, it can go viral across the network. Uh, let's all block him because he's, yeah. you're getting reports about this guy even though you never interact. Well, I think that's why, is because then even if, if his server admin doesn't actually delete that account, then at least I can protect my users and block him from my instance. Gotcha. So I think that's why it does that. Does a report like allow the option to say why you've reported or flagged them? On Peer2 it does. I don't know about Mastodon. I haven't gotten any reports. I'm just curious there. because it seems like you know, each server, because it has different moderation rules and what it does and doesn't accept, you know, you'd want to know why somebody got reported to maybe on that server. It's like, well, that's not a violation of our contest policies. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, you can see the, the tube or whatever they call it now. Oh, you, you can see what got flagged yeah. and decide for yourself. Right? Exactly. You know, decide for myself. What a concept. <laughs> And there's, there's also the nuclear option where your admin can completely block a, another instance. That's what happened to Gab, I guess, in 2018, is everybody blocked Gab. And well, so, if you keep running server raids on other servers, people are going to get annoyed. Oh, you yeah. should read the blog post from their admin. But you're almost implying that, like, if they're all stuck on their own server and only talk with each other, that's not the point or the fun for them or something. I don't know. But there could be a sort of a... Federation of evil, right? <laughs> like I've all these all these matched on servers that are all in the nasty shit, and they just like have their own universe. And Which is frankly fine, them. you know. People just don't want them coming in and trolling, brigading them. As I think a lot of people's complaints that they're off in their own network of ten servers that all talk to each other. At least we don't gotta see it. You know? <laughs> right. Well, I'm saying it could be it could be huge though. So, like they could you know they could expand. It could be a lot of lots. I mean, four chan has plenty of users. It probably would be huge. <laughs> I'm not saying 
interesting. Well, it's just, I mean, yes, it's just from graph theory, you, know, you have a large graph, much smaller than the main graph, but right, it's not connected to the rest of the graph. I will say I can think of at least two servers off the top of my head that are sizable, and I don't have one here from any of their users. So I would it's already that. happened. I guess that's by design. Right? Is meow.social one? <laughs> no. <laughs> Should it be? Do I, I mean, need to start with meow? For fluffies and scaling. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want to know more. Oh, of course there's an SEO dot chat. See, Glasgow.social. There's a, a geographical oh. one. Yeah. So just for scale, uh, I saw an article like, you know, 1.2 or 1.9, whatever the count is, two million active users on Mastodon is still maybe like half a percent of Twitter's user base. Um, yeah. It's okay, okay. Yeah. we don't want everybody to come. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was just saying. <laughs> Sweet, we'll have some of the cool kids. Some of them can stay there. Yeah, I want to steal one of this. It's like the advantage of Twitter is like it's kind of an unprecedented lead, right? There hasn't been, until recently, I know it's not representative, but I, I have that sense that there really, there at least is the perception that it is a public of a sort. That there is some people like to say it's like the public square, but like that. I've never been to a public square like that. I actually read a, a post on Mastodon, I think earlier today, that made a convincing argument for how Mastodon is more of a public square because you can choose, like everyone decides, you know, like you guys mentioned Gab. Everyone gets together and decides we don't want that here and just disbars it like an actual. At least it's it's they made the argument that it's more democratic than Twitter would be, whereas Twitter is ten executives at the top deciding what does and doesn't get said. So. Well, you can't really s scale the public square, right? Because it becomes kind of an unmanageable Chaos. conversation. Yeah, I mean, the part of the problem with Twitter is that it has too many people on it and. There's a lot of noise and junk. I mean, there's a lot of crap circulating, and Twitter uses an algorithm, you know, to try to manage the content or some combination of algorithms. But really, I mean, when I go on Twitter now, I, I have no real patience with this. Like, I'm not really seeing conversations anymore. I'm just seeing a bunch of drive-by posts, and it's like. It's like being hit by bullets from a million different guns, you know? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I would say that, like, you know, I've read some pretty interesting analysis to say that, like, you know, there's, there's a reason that even though Twitter is huge, like 400 million users, that it never quite got to the billions that Google or Facebook got to, which is precisely because despite what certain actors claim about Twitter, Twitter was actually fairly hands-off with moderation. They allow uncomfortable conversations between opposing viewpoints that Google, Facebook and Google's products do not allow. And so there's arguably an argument that Twitter might represent the absolute limit of how many people you can have in one space with a relatively free conversation. And that's what I'm most interested in. It's like, where, where do the uncomfortable conversations happen if we're all going into our own silos, right? We never get to have those could be very generative encounters, uh, especially if the uh, the search isn't actually going across everything that's being posted. And yeah. Well, so that actually I don't think has a good answer for that, to be honest. And well, that's, that's just what I'm wondering. Well, that does. Well, you should join the well. There's a lot of uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> that, 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 that actually gets yeah. into one of my personal theories, where you know I often like you know people talk about the danger of filter bubbles, but I actually think that a lot of the acrimony we see on the internet is actually because the internet has collapse people's filter bubbles. You're far more likely to meet people with bizarre viewpoints that might make you angry that you never encountered in day-to-day -day life, and you're finding that now on the internet, actually, so. Well, not ironically, I'm, I'm on the other side. I don't think the internet is really a good place to have those conversations because, uh, what's it called, Dunbar's number? I don't know if you guys have heard of that. Yeah, yeah. Basically, there's this, um, this theory that you only have a certain number of people that you can actually, like, think of as living, breathing people with their own jobs and concerns, like your friends and your family, and then once you get past that number, everyone else is just kind of like, for lack of a better comparison, like an NPC in a video game. That's like an argument for Discord servers. Right? That's an argument for Discord servers. 
you get on a Discord and there's some limited number of people there and it's a manageable conversation, you know? Yeah, but that's, that's my thing is I, I find when you have those conversations on the internet, especially in open forums where any part of my language jackass can just jump into the conversation, it quickly devolves and becomes completely useless. Exactly. Whereas when you have a more one-on-one -on -one or small group, especially in person like this, in my experience, they tend to be significantly more civil and productive. And you just so. run into so many different viewpoints when it's a literal global conversation. What mm -hmm. is a reasonable conversation about a difficult topic to one person can be like straight up identity based harassment to another person, and both those people can be correct at the same time, actually. So, you know, you know the well has been in existence as an online community since 1985, so it's been there for a long time. In fact, it's kind of a little bit geriatric these days. A lot of people on there aged quite a bit and, you know, keep talking about bringing in new blood. But there's been an ongoing conversation there about, oh, how do we attract new users? How do we attract new users? And then, do we really want to attract new users? How many people do we want to have on here? Because, you know, it's a few hundred people now, and various conferences have some limited set of people, and the conversations there are manageable, you know? Um, if you had a million people on the well, could you really have the kinds of conversations you can have now? Could you really have that sense of community that you have now? And I'll also I see a hand back there. Oh, Real quick, uh, would those conversations that you're looking to have happen more likely at the geographic ones I mentioned earlier? Isn't that like kind of, and that would like spur on real life conversations in person and meetups? You mean like a geographic based subreddit and local voting? Activism, low activism, all that jazz. Some of them, definitely. Well, I get. I realize if a million people join the well, it would become Reddit, right? <laughs> because Reddit is Not really structured quite a bit like the well is. But and you know, I'll just throw out my own experience. You know, with that because we have a few online presence with the at Boston. You know, I do a bit of moderation on them, and I'll say that like there's a part of me that's very happy these communities that we run are only you know, several hundred people because I can give it very personalized moderation attention. I can really look at every individual person, and you know, I, I really try to take a hands-off approach where unless somebody is being a troll, spamming, or harassing, it's like you know, as long as you're being respectful, yes, disagree, including with me. I try not to be a dictator about it. The truth is. If there were 10,000, 100,000 million people that had to moderate, I literally couldn't give it that high quality it deserves. I just couldn't. I'm one person. Kevin, did you know about this? Uh, when did you set us up? That's been on there for a long time. We set it up. I set it up what? It looks like. Oh, you set it up a decade ten, ago. Ten or John, you gotta tell me about. Uh, I thought you said post on there about. Yeah, who's been posting on there? I don't well, know. Well, the last post is three years ago, so don't worry too much about it. Uh, no, that one's one year ago. Oh, one year it's one NSO. Year ago. NSO is relatively new. Uh, well, yeah. like news. Yeah, yeah. I mean, an NSO is busy, also, whoever's posting. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. <laughs> They're not entirely wrong. <laughs> I think that it would be worthwhile for people to check this out. I mean, uh, maybe, well, we, could we do some apparently stuff with still it. have a couple minorly active users. Oh, 70 members. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now I think, I know. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still a moderator. Well, we technically okay. have a Slack room. Uh, people that is dead at this point that I should probably do something with at some point. It's true, you know, you set these things up and they just kind of sit there, you know. It's, yeah. it's not the right favors, but uh, I've been using Matrix a lot, which is uh, similarly built. You know, it's it's kind of rating, that's not that diverse. Right. Does anyone else here use Matrix? I love Matrix. Yeah. Matrix? Yeah. Uh, the most Matrix popular client is Element. Element. Yeah, Element's the application. Well. It's, it's one of them. When I first checked it out many years ago, it was mostly like Nazi portion types. Um, go to go to <laughs> go to matrix.org. Okay, matrix.org. A lot more. Uh, yeah. Oh, I love Matrix, man. It's great. Fantastic. It's kind of like Slack. It's it's like a chat protocol. Yeah. Sort of like XMTP, but it's always good to have another social network to join. So, so suppose there's a. Uh, so there's a Mastodon server on AWS. So they make a point about this one being a secure. So is it a little closer to signal in that way, where there's like actual privacy built into it? One-to-one -one chats have end-to-end -end encryption by default. Um, public rooms do not. That seems reasonable. But there's also some metadata that does get sent back to the server. Okay. So depending on how paranoid you, what your threat model. I wouldn't is. recommend it over signal, but right. it's doesn't require a phone. Right. 
So there's that one in the back. It shows how it works. Just to talk about the security, it's super easy to sell most. And then you can clearly see that if you're end-to-end encrypted, all your data is on your server, all your chat history, and it doesn't get more secure than your house. Kind of thing. Oh, right. <laughs> so. Very good. See, now what's happening here is that there's a bunch of new applications and platforms popping up that people can use, and pretty soon we're not going to have, like, everybody on Twitter, everybody on Facebook, people are going to spread out. And I, mean, and I, mean, and I, I hope so. And, I mean, that's an interesting point about permissionlessness, because one thing people have gotten correctly angry at Facebook so much over the years is that any time people were using Facebook's API in ways Facebook didn't like, Facebook would always shut down or change the API. You were literally at the mercy of what they wanted. You, you needed their permission if you wanted to do something. Well, that's, Facebook eventually is going to be a, totally a VR system. You know, it's going to be... Yeah, not, not with the graphics levels I'm seeing. <laughs> hey, they have legs now. <laughs> no, they don't. They locked that up. That was fake. Jason. <laughs> so what? Uh, so let's say somebody on a Mastodon server, uh, they're posting copyrighted materials. Let's say Sony's video clips or Sony's music. Uh, what's the procedure? For that, like they're gonna, somebody's gonna try to contact the administrator of the server. Now that that actually does get into one of the major open questions of why I decided for now not to have us run our <laughs> own server. What is the legal liability of illegal content as far as the server? Operator? There's a thing called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. <laughs> I am aware of it. I might have talked it's about it. It's the only thing time. left after the Supreme Court threw out the rest of the Well, CIA, the rest of the law was so. terrible. That was the only good part. And Section 230 is still in force today. Maybe not in a month, but, you know. So, so as, until the Supreme Court potentially ruins it, the answer is I can't be legally liable for both not moderating and moderating. Right. It's up to me, basically. I mean, it protects people who operate platforms because the person who should be responsible for infringing material is the person who posts the infringing Although material. Although, once again, add not legal advice, our lawyers on the board are not here. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. I, I am not a lawyer, Elon. <laughs> So, so when they go to Amazon and say, hey, one of your servers has copyright material on it. Why? That's right. Oh, yeah. And then leave it up to Amazon to do it. No, not really. Amazon should use it. Well, so you can able to convert it, and you go to the court, and the court just doesn't matter. And then the Amazon will basically want to send this advice. You have to provide a DMC to take down the same way Google does. Yeah, we think Amazon would probably contact you and say, like, hey, you have copyrighted material on here, and then you have to remove it. Oh, that is a good point. Down if you don't, but. That's a question about Mastodon, about having the DMCA, uh, you know, the contact person in this report. Well, I, I think, you know, there's also obviously the distinction between you might be protected from uh, criminal liability, i.e. the government's uh, attacking you. You could still get sued in claims court and other things, I assume, depending on what it is, you know. Uh, it'll take you probably a couple of years and about $40,000 in non recurrable attorney's fees <laughs> to explain to everyone that you are who you are and you haven't done anything wrong. Maybe we'll just right. get them to pass a law to do away with copyright. <laughs> well, all the uh, people I'm debating in the AI art debate won't be happy to hear you say that. Yeah. But Disney isn't going to let you. We're, we're coming up on this other Steve Bill Willie case here, and I think unfortunately they're going to push for it to extend once again. Well, yeah, I mean, I, how many more years does it take that he's in the public domain, or at least the earliest wrong version? So that, that Steve say, well, say, how many more years the universe is going to be It around. was supposed to be 20 plus years ago? Oh, I, I know. I, I thought about how many, but it says it is moving again. I think we just got Metropolis, which means Steve Willie should be legal at any time now if Disney doesn't stop it. Again, if it doesn't stop it. What are we doing? It's it supposed to be January 1st, 2024. All right, so we, we have. One year, we've had a couple of years of the public domain expanding. We have to make it through one more dangerous year to see what Disney might do. But I think we actually might be safe because I think it's only the old art version of Mickey that would be in public domain. The canonical one at their parks they would still control. That's technically correct, not to mention that they have canonically further versions there along. Right. It's just they still have previously been the main 
Come oh, on, I know. Oh, I know. I know. I just really pointed out that like the version yeah. of Mickey and Steamboat yeah. Willie yeah. does yeah. look substantially yeah. different from the version of these people. So they may not care until we get up to like the version I, from like 34 or 35, which is like again the historically they have cared. Yeah. They have, but for some reason they let it go on for now two, three years. I think it helps so soon the group who painfully owned Fox and Star Wars and Marvel. That might be it, is we they bought and enough not to care as much. They bought enough that they, they aren't worried about money. That might actually be very true. Our presenters have another suggestion. If you really want to get a major headache worrying about this stuff, just read Choke Point Capitalism. I'm kind of in the middle of it right now, and it's like, ah, how can they do that shit? I have learned a lot about the music industry, man. They do a great job of lining out how exploitative it is, and, and it's the worst. I just love an industry that tries to guilt me about piracy, but uh, Spotify still doesn't pay any of the artists anything. Well, I mean, the artists have never been paid anything by the record companies, record labels. I mean, it, it's ri been rigged all along to feed most of the money into other coffers. The artist just gets very little of it. Mm -hmm. Do we have uh, any final uh, Fediverse topics questions? Because we're supposed to be out of the room by 9, so we should think about wrapping this up here. What time is yeah. this? I have one last question. Um, there is a very popular community online called Self Hosted that do a lot of, um, they're obsessed with basically hosting all their own data. Uh, subreddit is super popular. Uh, I Are they related to the data order subreddit? No, no, they know. They didn't cross over. I've been a member of that subreddit since the subreddit. Anyway. Um, I have a question about IndieWeb. What does IndieWeb think about the self-hosting movement and like kind of having all your services, your photo services, your to-do lists, everything hosted at all kind of thing as a like as like a way of doing things? Is that self-hosted one that's been around for a long time where everything's like cores, access, like... So what the community often does is they buy a big server, they put a bunch of Docker containers like a photo service, a music service, all the services you have on your phone, they punch a hole in their router and they access their apps through that. Oh, okay. So I don't know. I, it sounds like IndieWeb hasn't really delved into this community much. Yeah, because that sounds more like a kind of a media type thing. Or yeah, they do. Yeah, it's also they do host their own apps and own services at home, and like it's, it's very much like um, trying to get like their own ecosystem. I was gonna say I would I would imagine they're not mutually exclusive at all because you guys are about. Um, Kind of, kind of in the same vein of like having control of your own identity. It's your web server. It's and your content. identities, and they just take it a step further and say, "Well, why don't we host it too, instead yeah. of like renting AWS servers and stuff like that?" Yeah. So I, I think they, I, I believe they would be very compatible if I understand it correctly. Yeah. I'm, I'm plugging my podcast. That's why I put that up. <laughs> And it was a, nice. maybe one more question before we call it here. That's like a, a very open-ended one, and you, you, you can address it at the point if you like. So where we're heading right now, and I'm uh, in charge of the infrastructure projects all over the world, uh, the power of the handheld device. So when you're saying that keeping your data at home, like, why is it there? Because this is your phone, and once we have a DC 5G, the necessity of the office network, for example, they're just not necessary. You don't care if it's Wi-Fi or if it's a decent sound soul or connection for whatever you do. So what would be the level of atomization acceptable? Because I know that you've been thinking it through way more than we did. So we're narrowing a server down to a cell phone. And then we're creating our small community right here. And then I can easily see uh, just when we were talking about storing data that goes to some Amazon Glacier service, and that service is encrypted by people, but that's uh, all the point. So, how granular can it possibly go? Because a homebrew server is fantastic, is wonderful, but nobody brews servers at home anymore, and whenever you spin a server here and there or everywhere, it becomes very mobile and fluid, especially with blog providers. So, when we're talking about spinning the server, that's probably going to be a VM or a a service on AWS or Google Cloud or whatever. So, so how granular can it possibly go? In theory, in the road, the vision. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I'm not sure where you're applying the question of granularity. Is it? Is 
Is it just to the portability? Well, technically we can narrow the servers to the handheld. Yeah, and I can exactly. manage it from here, and then we just federate our cell phones, and this is so I can create a bubble as little as I want. Well, you've kind of answered your own question. I mean, if it can go there, it's going to go there. Um, but there's still going to be, like, big servers. I mean, yeah, your data can be stored in the which cloud. Which stream? So I can provide you a which pointer stream? to the data which is in the cloud, which is fine. But all the database which maintains hundreds of thousands of records, that shouldn't be very hard to enable for a cell phone. I mean, to do a database query a reasonable amount of time. The, the issue with what you're saying is you're trying to do a cell phone instance, like, instance on your phone, but people want access to the data on multiple devices, and that's why you need this back-end service to load all these clients. I don't know if that answers yeah. your question, but that's why a server is like, Exist. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand yeah. why they exist. Yeah. I mean, how regular it can be, and can we eventually make it super portable? I, or can I we split the back end of the phone? I mean, I'll, I'll also say that just, you know, a lot of peer to peer solutions have traditionally required a lot of technical know how. A lot of the Federation subsidiarity is kind of trying to thread that needle where, like, you get some of the benefits of decentralization, but you don't have to self manage literally everything. It's kind of trying sort of best of both worlds, but it really depends on the application. Some things I agree, peer-to-peer -peer is just a better way of doing it, yes. I'm just envisioning Elon putting, uh, putting all of the Twitter servers on his cell phone and then losing his cell phone in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we lost Twitter. <laughs> what a shame. We flushed Twitter. That's close to reality. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's we probably just going to end on it. We need to clear the room uh, because you know we want to say grace with our host. Thank you so much to both of our speakers, and thank you all for coming. Like this yeah, is this actually, fun. I think, the easily best attended one we've had since post COVID. So thank you all for being here. We hope we'll see you in the coming year. Thank you.